Hey guys, welcome to Jerry's Live. As always, I'm your host, Amy Gardner Dean, and today is JL102. If you're playing along at home, you go to the jerrysartorama.com website. You're going to plug into that search bar, the JL102, and up's going to pop the entire list of the products that we're going to be featuring today. Um, it's more kind of like just a products list because people are always like, what was that? What was that? What was that? That's why we've got all those things listed there. And then it's an easy way to add an item to your cart if you decide that there's something you can't live without as an artist, right? Um, today it's going to be a demo on how to incorporate basic acrylic mediums. Now I know everybody gets really excited when they hear acrylic mediums and jumps at the, well, what about this medium? Well, what about that medium? Well, what about this medium? We just did the beginner acrylic painting episode, right? So we're trying to build from there. So this is gonna be the basic mediums that for the most part are like 95% of what any acrylic artist would even need. Beyond here is when it starts getting, don't you think, Katie, a little bit crazy, wacky, yeah. wild, Kool-Aid style acrylic mediums. But, uh, and. And don't worry if you're just like, ah, but why not the black lava gel? We've already done that, right? We've got um, episodes JL15, which was Whirlwind of Acrylics, where we went through every single acrylic brand that Jerry's carries, and we talked about them, and we showed them live, actually pouring them out so you can really see what those true viscosity differences are between them. Then we did an after party where we try some of them, um, that's on our YouTube uh, web, or our YouTube site. It's Jerry's Artorama. Just go to where we've done the after parties is what it's called in that section, and you can look and find that JL15 episode. Then two episodes later, we did JL17, and what we did is acrylic mediums, what you need and what you don't. That title is a little misleading because we pretty much showed most of the mediums, didn't we, Katie? But that was in an effort to educate you about, okay, so there's like seven of these things that are very similar that may be named very different things. Uh, we went through most of them in manufacturer brands. If there was something in one brand that others tended to carry, we would show it in that one brand, like the, there was the black lava gel, yeah. and then I think there was the white flakes where it looks like snow. So that episode has an after party as well so that's on our youtube channel that's jl17 so if you've got a pencil write that down and you can find them um, and then you'll be able to actually see those episodes we actually apply the acrylic on the after party in real time we show mikey so mikey gets to try it's like mikey tries but in an after party um and we also made these big um kind of i guess uh, basically a big plank and we've got all of the mediums spread out and dry, so you'd be able to see what that would actually do for you in your acrylic painting. So that was JL17. Then we did this episode where we did this watermelon slice. That was JL89, if you're just looking for some basic acrylic painting techniques. And then we also did JL70, which was the top 15 acrylic painting mistakes. So if you're just new at acrylics and you're not sure, and you haven't been with us for very long in the show, that's a great show for you to check out because it talks about some of those kind of basic mistakes that if you don't know, if nobody's ever taught you, or I hate to say this, but there is a pretty high percentage of incorrect information out there, even in YouTube videos, just because somebody has a channel and just because somebody has some products does not make them like the do all end all even with me, I make mistakes, but there's a lot of people out there there that are showing kind of basic techniques that may be incorrectly using mediums, especially when it comes to acrylic. So those are episodes that you can look for. An even cooler, easier way to find all these episodes at the top of the information, both on YouTube right now during this and on Facebook, we've got a link to a document that has every single episode we've done. After tonight, 102 will be added onto that, but it is updated to 101. There are, there's a list where it's all the chronological from start to finish of all those episodes. So if you're just looking for a number, that makes it easy to find. If you don't know what the number is and you're looking for a medium or something in particular, the other one lists it actually by 
you know, the title. If there's an acrylic section, there's that. If there's a demo section, stuff is in there. So you may find the same episode multiple times in there just under different categories. So both of those links are there for you to use when we're done with the show to be able to have that at your fingertips and refer to anytime you need it. Um, not everybody knows about that, so that's why I'm reiterating that right now. Um, another great tool to use is our Jerry's Live group that's on Facebook. You do have to answer a question to do the membership, and unfortunately you do need to be a member of Facebook to be part of that group. But we've got some people that just have a basic profile so they can be in that group and just be in groups online so that they can learn more about different mediums, they can see other artists work, they can get inspired, they can post work and ask for helpful, you know, techniques or even just feedback. This portrait I'm looking, you know, doing, something looks wrong and I don't know what it is who here can help. So those are all tools for you to use at your fingertips. I see a lot of people, and, and it's not viewers per se, but there's a lot of people out there just like there are in any different kind of interest group, so to speak, who are always like, I wanna know how to do this. I wanna know how to do that. I wanna know, I wanna know. But they don't A, Google that, <laughs> or they don't look for, if somebody says, here's some tools to use, they don't wanna take the time to go do that. They just want somebody to give them the short, sweet answer. And I understand, Everybody's got a different learning style, and that's one of them. However, that's a very short answer to what's going to be a long-term problem for you. The way people that learn and actually retain it better, I used to teach, I've had education psychology, is by researching it themselves. So they've got to read the information, they've got to learn the information, and then actually put it into practice. Not just get somebody's, you know, 10 cent version of just a quick spiel of what they need to do. So that's why those tools are there for you. That's why we built the show up over time and tried to integrate all of those different uh, mediums and techniques and guests and things like that. It's so that you've got this as a learning tool at your disposal. So I will get off my preaching soapbox because it looks like Amanda's falling asleep. She's not, but I'm just, I like the, the she gives me these glares and I, I live for those, those glare moments, Amanda. I love trying to get all the links up there for she, them. Well, she, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I thought that they were just You gonna... threw a bunch really fast. <laughs> oh, well, that's fine. That's, well, that's why they go to that document and look. It's a little bit of, they need to learn to find it. All right. So, um, what are acrylic mediums? Why are they important for you to learn about? And what medium should all of you acrylic painters not be without? There's one medium that I've got up here. These are just seven very basic mediums that most acrylic painters can incorporate in one way, shape, or form into an acrylic painting that they're doing from the ground up, from very beginner to somebody who's very advanced who's a professional acrylic painter. But there's one medium that all of you guys, all y'all, to quote Katie, all y'all, all y'all. See, I did the finger too, Katie. I'm not from the South, no thank you. Yeah, okay, so. Hey now. It's all information you need, eh? No. <laughs> There's a, that help with the Wisconsin family that feel, make you feel at home. That's Canada that says eh. Oh, no. Some parts of Not my part. Michigan and Wisconsin say it too. Believe me. Um, but, but you need to, there's a medium that you're going to need. So you're going to need to pay attention for that. Even if it's only for that, it's something you need to know. Um, what are the mediums for? They're to achieve very specific um, consistencies of paint, whether you're going to want to thin it down to a watery consistency and apply it more like watercolor, or whether you're going to want to make it thick like spackle. Acrylic mediums are there. This is the one medium out of all the mediums that has the largest amount of diversity, in my opinion, of things that you can add to the paint that work with the paint that are designed for the paint. With, a, with oils, there's some things, yes, that work with it, but you may have to put them on first and then put the oil over it, or they may not work with it as well. Everything here is designed as a polymer to actually be incorporated with pretty much any brand of acrylic. So that's a really cool thing that a lot of other painters don't have for a tool that you do if you're an acrylic painter. Um, also, mediums make acrylic paint up, like adhere layer upon layer in the most archival manner and they also keep it flexible. 
oil paints can crack, right? We know from, from drying and, and how the paint may dry out. But if you're using the wrong oil, if you're not painting fat over lean, et cetera, ad infinitum. With, oil, or with acrylics, you've got the tools where as long as you're not thinning that acrylic down too much with water, where it breaks those molecular bonds of the resin, you can apply thin layers, you can apply thick layers, and they're all going to stick and cement and build on each other beautifully that oil painters may not have that ability for. But you need to add those mediums to your paint. So we're gonna talk about those as we go along. Um, I'll go over the prior episodes that just that list again at the end, just for people who caught us kind of late. Um, the girls put them on the link. Oh, awesome. Well, so we don't have to do that because you guys rock. Thank you, Amanda. That was that was worth your cranky face. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, uh, no, special cupcake for you later. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. I want cupcake. <laughs> Why well, much she would make me a special, you know, oh, cupcake I, that's not oh, a. I thought you were gonna make me one. That's I can. What I thought. Yeah, I only have almond flour though. You may you may not enjoy the cupcake. Um. All right, so. Terminology that you want to learn from this, just so as I'm, I'm talking about this, it makes a little bit more sense. A medium. A medium is a pourable, thinner than average, soft body or heavy body texture that you're adding to that acrylic, okay? It's used for thinning the paint. Anytime you're adding this, you're taking the pigment and making that pigment load lighter, okay? So you'll want to remember that and keep that in mind. I see people all the time that mix something with their medium and then it looks much lighter or if they're using something like paste, suddenly the color changes. So we're gonna talk about that and that's something that you need to know. Um, some of these mediums that they design are specifically supposed to alter the luster of the paint. What does luster mean? It's the sheen. You've got gloss, you've got satin, which is like a semi-gloss, you've got matte. Those are things that you may see on there, matte, satin, gloss, that you need to know that's going to alter whatever the sheen of your paint is. Some brands of acrylic, like Matisse, are more matte. Some brands are super glossy, like Soho. We love the gloss of Soho. Sometimes it's a little hard to see on camera because yeah. it's a little shiny. It's shiny. A little shiny. But you can change that. It, you don't have to go, oh my God, I can't ever use Soho because I'm going to take photos of my paint. You need to know that you use a satin medium or even you add a matte medium to change that luster, okay? Um, now, things to keep in mind, a matting agent can cause cloudiness, especially when you're talking about the thinner, lighter mediums that are used for thinning the paint down for more like glazing techniques where you don't have that pigment load that shows through as easily. The issue with that is because it tends to be matted by inert pigments. What are those like silica? You know how silica is like kind of like a sand, but it's for the most part clear, right? You ever bust open one of those little silica gel packets when you get it in your shoe or something like that? You've got those little kind of cloudy beads rolling around the house and you're trying to pick those up. It's like that, but ground down so that it's fine, so that it works in that medium but it can cloud the color. So you need to know that. So if you're doing glazing where you need that sheen to like show through and all those colors to be just, you know, very kind of like looking in a nice, beautiful reflecting pool, you don't want to be using matte medium for that because that will cloud that up and make that more difficult. Okay. Um, so let's start out with the basic mediums. These seven that all artists should be familiar with. We're going to start with the thinnest and we're going to move to the thickest. Um, for the studio, uh, we're just using for hyperbole, um, most of these are the Jerry's studio mediums. We do have some from Golden that Jerry's does not offer just because those are ones that are important that most acrylic painters are gonna need to know about. Uh, so what we're gonna, we're gonna do the more fluid mediums now. Uh, we've got the Jerry's studio acrylic. I got the um, satin medium and varnish. Why satin? Because then if I'm working with something that's super shiny, if it's Soho Acrylics, it kind of knocks that sheen down. If I'm working with Matisse, it bumps the sheen up. So it's a little bit more of kind of an average across the border uh, luster, if you will. I love that word. Luster. Luster. It's like luster, but sexier. 
I mean, they're probably a sexy luster somewhere, but. Um, so when it says medium and varnish, there's some that are just mediums, there's some that are just varnishes, and then you have, ta-da, a medium and varnish. Now, in some ways, this can save you money, and in other ways, you need to know about why maybe this isn't the ideal varnish for you. Now, as a medium and a varnish, it's a nice, thin, kind of more watery quality that can take your paint and take it from, you know, like a heavy body where it's very viscous to where you can thin it down and actually start to lose some of the brush strokes. You don't see kind of the ridges that that brush is going to leave. That's fantastic for that. It does make your paint, even if it's an opaque paint, more translucent the more of this that you add. Um, so it's used for thinning paint very drastically if you want. Glazing, brushable. Additionally, it can be used as a non-removable varnish. What does that mean? What that means is that varnish can be removable, which is a more archival way to go long term, or it can be a varnish where it's a medium and varnish and it's just always on there. Now, is that a bad thing? No. Is it a bad thing if you have like a fire in your house and there's smoke damage to your painting? Yes, it is, because you're going to have to talk to somebody that does restoration work to actually figure out what safe way to remove that off your varnish is going to be. Where if you've got a varnish that's removable, that's thicker, that provides better protection, that can actually be stripped off and then the painting can be re-varnished again. So that's where it's not always the best choice for something like that. But let's say that you're working fast, you're trying to meet deadlines, um, you got something for a show, you don't have time, the, the, you know, the other varnishes take a little bit more time to dry, There's, you have to do an isolation coat and let that dry extensively. This can be put on and you can take the painting to the show. So that's where this really can come in handy and you can still always do a final varnish over it as long as the painting is clean. So, so it's a great multi-use product that it's really good to just have in your studio, even if you never use it as an actual varnish. Yes, Frida. Does Golden carry a comparable product? Um, I know Liquitex does Golden May as well. I can't remember. They seem to be a little more hardcore on just the separate varnishes and that, but they do have glazing liquid, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, which is pretty much the same thing as a medium. It just dries slightly slower. Okay, so we're going to very quickly look at, at how if you can switch to this one, Katie. Um, so this is the watermelon picture that we did in our basic um, little class. I'm actually going to put some of this over it as varnish so you can see how thin it is, and then we'll mix some paint with it. Don't you think that that's probably a good idea? Oh, there's my palette paper. I was like, where did my palette paper go? Okay, and I did not put out a varnishing brush, which was not... You want something to put under that so that when you try to move it when it's wet, it doesn't go like that. Uh, I can just put this under it. Actually, I'll just put a thicker sheet of water. Well, let's do this. All right. Do we have any just very soft bristle brushes? I'll, I'll mix while you're doing that. I'll mix the okay. paint with it. Uh, something. To, oh, yeah. Perfect. That's perfect. Okay. Let's use that. No, no. no. Perfect. Good perfectly fine. All right. All right. So with this product, you're not going to want to shake it up a whole bunch before you apply it. Um, because you're going to have foaming with it. You're going to have air bubbles that could stick to the painting and kind of get in that textured canvas and then not end up applying very well. I'm just going to do part so we can see it on there. when applying varnish, use a soft, very soft bristle brush and then wet it first so you've got, um, it's easier to clean out of your brush, especially if it's a natural hair brush after because the acrylic medium will get right in those natural hairs and make a big mess of it. Alright, right, I'm going to kind of do it across the middle so people can see. 
Now, you can see that it's cloudy at first, right? It's almost blue looking, isn't it? Here, it doesn't. Does it look like it's been on the mm -hmm. thing? Mm -hmm. Kind of overbrush that little part there. I'm just going to do it on half. Okay. Now, while this is still wet, you notice I'm working pretty quickly. I'm just going to take that the opposite way. I'm not standing it up like this. I'm kind of laying it down with the stroke to smooth it down into the grain as easy as possible. Okay. All right. Can everybody see that? See how that changed the sheen? We used this satin, uh, this is the gloss medium varnish. We actually used a satin medium and varnish when we painted the artwork originally. And that's why, because we used the Soho paint, but look at how much more kind of flat <coughs> matte that is mm -hmm. there. Um, I'm going to kind of hold it up so they can see the... And this will dry clear. See how the, that's a big sheen difference, isn't it? Will it stay that shiny? Uh, it'll probably flatten out some, but it's still going to be pretty shiny. When, they're, when they say gloss, it's glossy. they're not kidding around. Um, and that's another reason why it's not the worst idea to do your photography first before mm -hmm. you actually do your varnishing because Unless you've got somebody that's really good at, at what they're doing, that can potentially be a problem. You know, if a photographer, that will be, they'll have to have a, a kind of one of those light boxes like Will showed us the time mm -hmm. we did photographing your art. Filtered light. Yes. All right. So with this extra that we've got here, we're going to take this and just show how we can thin that. Now see, I can make this a really nice, very thin. You can see the color, but you can just see how it's getting a little cloudy right now. It's a little foggy, milky, sort of. Look how thin that is. It's almost like watercolory. Glazy. Mm-hmm. That my friends that's how you make a glaze you can if, if I had a softer brush this is a synthetic that's supposed to be more of like uh, close to a, a boar bristle that would be um, very soft and you wouldn't see that little bit of line to it okay so you know that's compared to this you can see when I do that you can see the stroke you can see it come off the edges look how that thinned that down very nicely now that little bit of cloudiness as it dries will clear out of there and it will just be the color, but it will still be that very soft, very thin watered down difference. So if I was going to take this and still wanted to keep some of the body to it, you can thin it right there. Normally you'd add this in reverse. You'd add the medium to the paint. Now see how that's much more brushable. It's other than you can kind of see the stroke some, it's much more flat. I can take that little bit of texture out of there. See the difference? You want me to hold it up to the camera? Will, is that help? Okay. All right. So that's the difference between those. Would it be okay to add a little bit of water to thin it down further, or would that cause problems with the paint? You can add some water. She asked if you could add some water to uh, thin it down further. You can add it some to a point. Now, that being said, if anybody's been, if anybody kind of is always kind of uh, looking at Golden's newest research and stuff that they put out like me, um, they have determined with their paints, not with other brands, but with their paints, 
you can actually thin them down very, very far to water. And this, it'll still, and they did scrub tests to try to lift it up and everything else, but that's their paints. That's their particular polymer resin. Now, is that true of every other brand? I, I'm going to tell you right now, no. definitely not. You would want to do your own testing with that, just like they did. Read their research and do your own testing with your own brand. Um, or contact the manufacturer. Most of them have pretty good help. Yeah, if it's something where they've, yeah, if they've, where done, they've, the testing, yeah. Where they've done the testing. So, um, you know, that's definitely something to consider. So, um, you can add, add, it depends on what you're talking about adding water. There's adding a little bit, and there's adding just like you're filling your brush and your water drip is dripping down, dripping down, dripping down. You know, this made this pretty thin and very brushable. And this is watercolor paper, so that soaked in a lot. I could have gotten a lot more coverage out of it if it was on canvas. But the watercolor paper is matte, so it's a little bit easier to show that uh, sheen, you know, and all that. So, put this back over here. Now, I did little swatches of these so you could see how glossy this is. This was done yesterday. It looks like a little fish because it got, it started oozing over under the, under the bottle. This part's dry, but you can see it's very flexible. It's not cracking or picking up off the paper. It's bonded to it really nicely. This part's still a little tacky because there was a much deeper, um, kind of, <laughs> it's like a cool fish, a much deeper amount of the varnish that got on there. And which one is that again? That's the same one we just used, which was that Studio Acrylic Medium and Gloss Varnish. Gloss Medium, Gloss Varnish. Okay, so that started drying pretty quick. I am can touch the, uh, I mean, the, the yeah, adding a medium is going to tend to slow it down some, but I can touch this and nothing's coming up. This is just slightly tacky, and we just put it on there. This is going to be wetter, but I can still see that it's starting to dry. So let's say I want to do glazing. Let's say I'm doing portraiture. Let's say I'm trying to work wet and wet. This medium may not be the medium for me. I may want to do something like the golden um, satin. I've got, I picked satin just because, again, I like to use satin, but they've got glazing liquid. They have it in satin, I believe they have it in matte as well. This is an acrylic thinner that's designed for glazing specifically. Uh, for You can blend edges, you can put layers and kind of work colors in and out of each other. This product, even though it's thin, is designed to be viscous enough where you can do glazes vertically when you're working at an easel, that means it's standing up, right? Where it's not gonna go rolling off your, uh, your canvas. So it's designed specifically for glazing, just like if you've got, if you're into oils and acrylics or in, you know, into oils and looking at acrylics, it's going to give you what a glazing medium is going to do where they've got that like sun thickened linseed oil in the medium where it's got like kind of like a honey like texture to it. So make sure that I pop this open. Yes, I did. Yay. Love these little bottles. Okay, so you can see that that didn't level as much when I put that on there. This is actually it from yesterday. Now, this is because it dries slower and it's a glob. It's still got some tack. It will pick up with my finger, but it's like got a, a peak to that. So it's it's already, you know, setting up from, when did I do these yesterday, Katie? About 4.30, 5 maybe? It's about, about 24 about hours. 24 hours, yeah. Um, so, but this is obviously fresh, so this is going to work better. But this slows that drying rate down, okay? So, if I'm wanting to work with this, let's pick a color that's very different than the blue. My brush is wet down some have my color out here I can add my glazing liquid as much as I want you can see how that changed a little it became a little whiter it's because there's that liquid in it that will that's where the color shift is in acrylics guys when they say that acrylics dry different it's because 
polymer on its own wet tends to look white and then it dries more clearly. So you will get some color shift. This will go back to that darker color. Let me make sure I've got, can see what I've got here. See how that's a nice, nice glazing. That's a little smoother even than that medium and varnish was. Okay, but if I want to come back in here and work some of this thicker color in, you can feel that glazing liquid pick up. You would not, if this was just a regular medium and varnish, it would be sticky and it would really kind of uh, feel like you were kind of touching honey that had been spread across the surface. I can kind of brush that in with that glazing and mix that to make that darker without that glazing liquid sticking and tacking up to it. So, um, you know, let's add a little bit of blue so you can see where the kind of breaking point is of that. So I can brush this back in. Look at how nicely that blends. You really can't see the brush strokes and lines nice and soft, right? So that's what that glazing liquid is gonna do for you. If you paint mostly in impasto and you're not doing like skin tones where you're doing color upon color or, you know, variations of, of fur or just, um, you know, glazing water in a landscape scene, possibly, where you're not painting plein air, this may not be the medium, you know, that's gonna help you. Again, these aren't necessarily for everybody. There's only one on here that specifically is. Uh, but it gives you a lot of nice options to be able to thin those colors and use them more traditionally like oils would be. Okay. Hey, real quick. Yes. <clears throat> if you use the matte medium, would it help to be able to photograph it? Or do you think it would still catch shine? The best thing you can do, um, and we've talked about this with some of those other medium shows, but I think it, it bears mentioning here. If you're photographing your artwork before you varnish it and you could like that high gloss, it's really good to work with a satin medium, not necessarily a matte medium. Because sometimes that matte medium, if you put a lot of it in there or it's a lower quality brand, or it's not shaken before you put it out, that stuff, because it's actually particulate, is gonna settle to the bottom of that container. You can dump it, and maybe this time you'll get some of the sludge from the bottom, maybe this time you won't. You can have areas that can be chalky looking, depending, especially with lower quality ones. Um, you know, and when I say that, I, I don't mean that they're necessarily bad. With especially medium and mediums and varnishes, if something is super inexpensive, the chances are there there's somebody's bought a formula from somebody else. It's not a company that's done all that research. That's where prices get more expensive in paint. It's not just because oh that's the best or oh there's this or that. It's because they use good quality pigments. They have you know the the highest amount of testing and things like that built into their product so that it performs accurately every time. So there's, you know, it's cohesive. So not the best idea always, because sometimes matte can sink um, in a painting. All right, it's a good question. Thank you, Amanda. All right, so now we're gonna talk about retarder. over here now this is gonna be super sticky and we'll show it ah. all right so we've got our little kind of swatch of the retarder here and you can see it's if I hold it up like that I can feel it start to shift the weight even though that's been sitting open and loose I can see it starting to kind of push the weight down so this is still not dry an acrylic you know, some of the thicker glosses and stuff um, are gonna have gelled over by now. Even that glazing medium had already gelled over. It wasn't until I really pushed into it that some picked up. Don't be offended by it being, saying retarder, that's just what it is as far as a chemical name, right? It's designed to slow something down. It's designed to be put in with your acrylics 
and give you that open time that's going to be longer even than that blending medium. Okay, now, that being said, this can come back to bite you in the butt. If you live in a super humid area, Florida, some of the swampier parts of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, something like that, this may not be your best friend. You Glazing liquid might be better for you. You may find, especially if you're thinning it too much with retarder, that this takes days and days and days. And that's probably not what you want. So it's, it's worth experimenting with some of these products for glazing and things like that if you know you either live in a super dry environment or a super humid environment, okay? Which I know that that's not the fun of getting to painting and being able to work right away, but it's the fun in being able to produce reliable results if you've got a commission or, you know, something like that, or trying to, you know, beat the clock on a family portrait for grandma's 75th birthday or something. Our viewer Susan Gardner was asking about a medium that she could use to help blend her colors together, like in a rainbow, for example, so that there's not that harsh line. Would this be a good option for that? The, okay, so we're talking about, uh, she's asking, would the retarder be a good option if she's doing a picture like a rainbow where she wanted to really blend those colors in together so it looked more like pris the kind of light through a prism as opposed to little kids hard lined rainbow the glazing medium would definitely be more what you're wanting to do unless this is something where it's gigantic and you're going to be working on it for a longer amount of time the glazing medium ha is a retarder in and of itself because it's got so just like when i was saying where i could it's still damp to the touch where i worked it in i can feel that it is now it's on watercolor paper so it's drying faster than it normally would be but that might not be you know that might do the trick perfectly fine the retarder may take a lot longer okay so i'm adding some of this this is definitely a thinner um consistency than than the you know the soho is kind of a medium heavy body and it's not soft body and it's not super super heavy body um so that's thinning it down so you can thin that down and make that brushable on the surface, either add a little or a lot, but again, you might not want to add too much if it's something where you know you're going to um, need this product to work faster. It's, it's nice and smooth. I've, I've never used retarder and I like that texture to it. Um, but again, you're going to want to practice with it and, and try that out, okay? But yeah, you can definitely feel the additive nature of, of that in there. It does not feel the same as that regular acrylic does. Okay, so you know what Golden says on their website, it's a medium additive used to increase or decrease the dry time of acrylics it's a thin bodied when used with heavy body or uh, acrylics, unless you're going down to fluid acrylics. It's, it's much more like uh, about the consistency of what a fluid acrylic would be. It's for wet and wet techniques. It reduces skinning on the palette if you apply it to the paint. What that is, is skinning is when you get that kind of funny, like skin like really cover, right? Almost like pudding gets that skin on top of it. That's the same thing in acrylics. If you add retarder to it, you won't have that issue happen. They also have a re-wetting spray that you can pump on that keeps that from doing that. Um, now, they say don't exceed one part of the retarder to six parts of paint ratio, okay? Because there's not enough binder in this to then make your subsequent layers adhere properly if you're using more than a sixth of the amount being the retarder. Okay, so something to be aware of. Um, oh, it's super, like, just picked right up. There's no skinning to that at all from the, the one that I did yesterday. My finger went right down into it. So they aren't kidding when they say that it's not going to skin your paint on the palette if you put that in. All right. All right, now, so you like how thin some of these were, but you want something to really be kind of easier to put into 
make something much more watercolor like maybe you're wanting to splash paint on a surface where it actually looks like colored water as opposed to you know something thicker like a Jackson Pollock painting right where it's a house paint where that's kind of more of like a I guess a fluid body paint airbrush medium is probably what you're going to want to go with now this is something that you can apply or put in with uh, both the fluid acrylics and even some with the high flow it actually works better with the fluid acrylics um, to be able to thin that to use it in a spray application but you can actually thin down heavy bodied and soft bodied acrylics with it but you may need to thin those with water before if you're doing a spray thing we're talking about using this as a medium for actually painting with a brush not really for spraying today okay now it's a hundred percent acrylic binder system it, it reduces those acrylics so then it sticks onto things but guess what else that it's really awesome for that I did not know until I researched this using with heavy bodied acrylics as a fabric medium and it doesn't require a heat setting so you don't have to iron it they do make a GAC 900 which is what we used when we used it with the acrylics episode and we talked about how you can make your paints into actual fabric paints this you don't have to heat set okay so that's a pretty darn cool thing now they said that if you use high flow you've got to use the 900 because high flow is so much thinner and the 900 is a little thicker than this all right so you can do like watercolor effects with it that's what this is is used for you can see with this shot of this Katie, if you can hit our side view it's just that littlest bit wet because I really poured it on and it puddled but it's it's very watery it's flat it levels perfectly okay so it would be good for watercolor techniques we'll put a little bit of this out and you can see that's super super thin Ooh, it's runny it's like water yeah for airbrushes, it's it goes it sucks up in that thing better with the airbrush if it's uh let's get a darker color here. Now with the heavy body, sometimes if you're finding you've kind of got like lumpy color, you may need to thin it with water first. Just because those solids sometimes don't break down this is actually working pretty good oh yeah look at that nice little color wash so you could pick that up with a you know synthetic watercolor brush and do some really nice you know thin washes of color to really thin something down that makes that um it's a ultramarine that's why it's a little grainy um it looks like almost like a periwinkle doesn't it so just like watercolor that airbrush medium can do that for you okay so that's because there's always people that are like well I want to use it for watercolor too well you, you can but you need to have the right medium the acrylic paint will do it the acrylic paint will do most anything but it's all about and how you alter that viscosity for the purpose that you've got it intended for okay so I'm going to throw this over here. Remind me to look at the varnish thing at the end, Katie. So remind me and we'll look at the varnish at the end because okay. that should be dry enough to the touch at that point where they'll be able to see. Okay, so now we've gone thin, thin, thinner, thinnest there. Now we're going to go the opposite direction. We're going to start looking at the thicker paints. Uh, paint additives. So we're going to talk about the one medium that you as an acrylic painter should have and that is a gloss gel or as golden terms it a soft gel. Okay it needs to be gloss because it's got that higher resin count. This is your miracle drug of acrylic choice for making what's called an isolation coat and we talk about that in those other acrylic shows so refer to those for what that means or go to Golden's website and they talk about it specifically. But this you're going to actually thin with water and you're going to brush on at least two to maybe three coats 
you know, vertical and then horizontal and vertical again, however you want to do it, to seal that painting off from a final varnish if you're not going to use a medium and varnish combo. All right, what that does is acrylic, everybody says, oh, but it's so flexible, but it's so durable, it's plastic, right? Yeah, plastic is incredibly porous. Your meat can pick up the smell of other things in a refrigerator, right? Why do you, why do you put the Arm & Hammer baking soda in there to absorb smells? It's because even with plastic, smells can permeate in or out because it's soft, it's porous. Same thing with paints. Yes, it's durable, yes, it covers easily, but it's easily damaged, it's easily abraded. It's porous, so uh, things like, uh, you know, if you're a smoker and you smoke in your house around your artwork, that can soak into the pores of your artwork. Dust, dirt, all the stuff that's just in your house. We're artists, so we like to take the time to paint, not dust the house, right? That stuff gets in those acrylic pores and sits there. This seals that out first, and then you can put that final varnish over it. So when it starts getting gummy, gooey, dirty, whatever, that varnish can be taken off. This protects the removal from going down and maybe potentially damaging your color. And then you can re-varnish over it, okay? So that's just what all acrylic painters need to know about that. But what it is in a nutshell in the jar is it's clear polymer that's made without the pigments, okay? This is essentially paint without the pigment. It's gonna be about the same texture as your usually heavy bodied acrylics, maybe slightly softer. Um, it's an, used as an extender. It can take a professional grade, let's say you really like to work with professional grade paints because it's got that concentrated color. But let's say you're working large, you don't always have to use those straight from the tube to cover larger areas. You can thin them down and make your professional color a student grade paint and make it go a lot further. Make that pigment kind of pay for itself with coverage by thinning it down with that. Um, it's just going to scoop out, right? Paint. Paint without the pigment. That's all that is. So. And will that dry clear? Yes, it will. I'm trying to find where I put the... This is still, because I put it on very thick, it's still, um, it's tacked up. Oh. Oops, oh, sorry. You can see the texture of that. It's still slightly white because it's going to take, with something this thick that I put on, it's going to take probably, and it's humid in here, because just it's North Carolina, and it's not December. I mean, I guess it's humid in December, too. But um, So this would probably take this thickness multiple days for that to completely dry fully, okay? So when you add your pigment to that, Okay, the nice thing about gels, super flexible, right? Because they got lots of our acrylic resin in it. Um, the gloss gel also, and it's the gloss, not the matte or the satin, is ideal for using for a um, mixed media application as an adhesive that can hold some pretty heavy things, right? Um, okay, see, I've just added this to my color. I'm going to mix it in. It mixes really nice and easy because it's the same kind of material. And suddenly I've got a lot more paint than I put down. Can mix this in. Mm -hmm. Look how quickly that disappears. And then I've suddenly got a lot more paint than I had, right? Mm -hmm. Now it is a little bit more, you know, it's got a little bit of transparency if I'm not kind of you know, doing the coverage where it's got a little bit of thickness to it, but that just made a whole lot of paint just from that. So, good way to extend color. Um, so you can use that for a glue for mixed media application. You're putting fabric on your canvas. Let's see, 
uh, you're, you know, adhering maybe some coins, something like that. That's going to be nice and strong. Um, variety of, it's got the sh different sheens to it. Um, it's got a variety of textures and consistencies in all the gels. So whatever texture you like, there's going to be a gel for that. So it's, it's like there's an app for that. There's a gel for that, for acrylics. All right. Um, another thing. So I just did this. I could have done something very different if I wanted to have this texture but not use as much paint. I could have just taken my gel and put it on, made a similar texture to it. I've picked up a little green with it, but this is just for hyperbole's sake. Okay, see how that's got some nice texture to it? Let that dry and then with very little green painted right over that. Would still have all that texture to it, but I'm not having to waste paint. It would have it would have taken maybe a tenth of the paint that I put down to mix to put, you know, to color that a nice solid color. And especially if you're looking for opacity over that texture and not where it's kind of got a little bit of transparency in it this would be the way to do that. Apply your texture with your gel, then paint over it, gel or, or paste. And we'll talk about pastes in a minute, okay? All right, so that was the regular gel, this uh, Studio Gloss Gel Medium. Now we're gonna look at the heavy gel. What is heavy gel, you ask? It's, it's exactly that. It's gel, but a heavier texture than your, um, so shiny it doesn't want to show up as easy see how thick that is that was just barely just slapping a little bit on with a palette knife it holds much heavier peaks but yet it's still that um it'll get transparent so you can get super great you know thick transparent color with this thicker gel i mean look when i pick this up that's Crazy thick and heavy, so thick it's sticking to that palette knife. Very Dairy Queen of you. Hmm? Very Dairy Queen of you. Yeah. Is it Dairy Queen or is it um, the custard place where they concrete and yeah, flip it and show you that it's your spoon is stuck in there forever? All right. So let's add some orange to that. So I've got just a little squirt of the orange, right? Is it heavy gel in with it? Look how quickly that picks that color up. It's crazy. Now, at first, when when you just kind of a word to the wise, it's like, oh my gosh, it's softer, it's not heavier anymore. Acrylic gels are thixotropic, means that the movement that you make with them as you're kind of mixing the color tends to make them soften and get kind of smoother. Once you stop that movement, it will thicken back up. Okay, it's just the physical properties of it. The whole thing's worn a little bit. Okay. Just a little bit. There we go. Barely Is that better? Yeah. Okay, so we can take this and, of course, I picked one that's mm -hmm. nice and thick. Look at how you could just put that on, like, and let that sit there, and that would dry, and you've got, like, crazy amounts of texture, right? Or you can thin it down and, you know, move it around or use texture tools or, like, when we did the palette knife episode, uh, we used all those cool things. That would be fun to play with with this heavy, the heavy gel. All right. So then. Better let that one dry for a long time. Yes. All right. So let's flip this. Is it still on there? Yes, it is. Okay. Move these up a little bit. Honor. It just was yes. Very close to the no, no, that's fine. All right. So we've got those. The heavy gel is going to give you kind of the maximum volume with the gel, so it can be transparent. So if you wanted to make that really thin, colored, you know, that would work. Now we've got the paste. So what is the difference between the gel and the paste? Paste is very opaque. See how that's almost whitish, kind of a whitish gray. Now they put 
that silica in there so it's it's thicker and grittier and grainier and they put a little bit of pigment in there too what is that's going to do for your color and you need to be aware and this is where putting it down first and then painting over it may be more cost effective as you can get this crazy texture like this but it's going to actually lighten your color some because it's got that little bit of pigment in there okay Ooh, and it feels kind of it feels it's matte and feels sandy all right let's find another lemon do we want a lemon color Okay, I'm going to put the same amount that we've been kind of putting out with these so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. And I'm going to get some of these heavier use a little bit easier to see. See how that did not like light up with color? It's much paler, isn't it? It's harder to work kind of that pigment in because it's got that weight and it's got those kind of additives in there. I just picked up some green, so we're going to have some green in here. Sorry about that. Color contamination. Okay, so this is the same color now that I put out this. See how different that is? It's a big difference, right? But it was about the same amount of color. So that actually changed that color. This color, this isn't going to dry and when it's clear, be back to the brightness and boldness of that because it's got that kind of whitish color to it. So that's why this would be better to kind of potentially, if, you, if you're painting on a big painting and you don't want to waste a lot of pigment, you're going to want to put that down first, let it dry, then go back over and actually paint it. Then you could use any of those gels or you could use the retarder or you could use any of that stuff to make it more brushable and take longer to dry right on top, right? Okay, questions. Do we have them? Um, BP was asking what the likelihood of pigment flaking off of the paste it was, but I am pretty sure that it wouldn't because it's bound in there. Right, very good. Um, BP asked, is there, is there going to be problems with adhesion, I think is what yeah. she's mm -hmm. saying overall. These are made with the same acrylic resins that the paint is, right? That the gel is. The gel is the same thing, just without the pigment. This is virtually the same thing. It's just got some inert pigment already in it, which is that kind of silica and probably a little bit of zinc or titanium white. Going to bond right to it. And because it's a little bit more porous, if anything, it's going to stick even a little bit better. You're just going to want to remember, BP, don't thin it down a whole bunch with water because you want that bond to be acrylic to acrylic. So if you're thinning it way down, you may have some problems with adhesion. That's when you're going to want to use, you know, your medium and varnish. You're going to want to use uh, a glazing liquid. You're going to want to use something to, instead of thin it down and take that resin out, you're going to want to use resin to resin to make it the best bond with that thicker gel or your piece. Just remember, if you can't remember which is clear, which isn't, paste, toothpaste. It's really rare that you have a toothpaste you can see through, right? There's some, but they're usually white and lumpy, right? Mm -hmm. Gel, aloe vera gel. It might be green tinted, but you can still see through it, right? So just use those kind of to think of that. Another question, Amanda? Lindsay asks, when you're painting, how would you account for color shift? And isn't that where color charts would really come in handy? Lindsay gets an A for today and a big star and a big a big heart from Amy yes that's when you want your color charts that's stuff you should have already done with your paints right she said color shift where can where can is that going to fall and come into play you know you want to use those gels and mediums a lot you can swatch those too right you can mix them to see at what point you, know, you don't have to use just like I've gratuitously splayed it out here. You can just use small amounts to small amounts and see what's that going to look like when I put more pigment in, what's it gonna look like when I put less pigment in. So you kind of know this is what I expect to have it look like. Yes, that might not be fun to you. Some of us 
very much enjoy swatching. It's very therapeutic. And you might not always have the time to wait overnight to see how it turns out, but the, the time and effort and wasted man hours in doing a painting where you didn't take the time to do that, and then you, you know, are in a rush, and then it's not working, and then, you know, some of these gels or something you didn't realize where you live is gonna take five, six, seven days to fully get clear to dry. That's why it's good to practice this stuff first. Then once that's out of the way, you kind of already know. So good question, and you listened. It makes me so happy. Do we have any other questions? All right, well, let's look at the varnish one last time. Okay. And it's flattened some, and it's pretty much dry to the touch. So it's got some sheen to it still. See the, there's our watermelon. Now when you turn it down, you don't see the sheen because the light's not grabbing it. But look how much more rich the dark is in here than up here. Isn't that nice? It's much deeper. The red is deeper. This is right where our line is, right here. Okay, now I'm going to lift it back up. You can see where that sheen is. Angle it back down. See what I'm saying about how much richer those darks are? Even though those darks look lighter, once you put that varnish on, it's a big difference. It kind of takes it right back to that. And that's the other thing where that medium and varnish blend really helps. With oils, you have what's called retouch varnish. When areas get flat and sunken and matte looking, you can give it a spritz with just a spray of retouch varnish. Brings it all kind of back up to that sheen. Your dark colors that you might have lost where it's matte, suddenly you can see the cook. You know, you might lose your violets. You might lose your blues. You might lose your browns. That retouch varnish popping it up, suddenly you can see the color differences in the same value range, okay? With this, it does the same thing. You can use that medium and varnish to put a coat over it, to bring it all up to the same sheen if you're using different brands of acrylics and it will make you know that okay this is where I'm at I need to do this or that or oh gosh that's coming together faster than I thought so that can be used as a tool not just necessarily a varnish all right where are we are we good do we have uh, we've had all the answers okay well, that's good. Well, I, I know this is basic. I know these are basic materials, and I hope nobody feels like we're kind of dumbing this down in any way. We're not. We're saving you the time and effort and investment in buying a whole bunch of things that maybe for your painting purposes you don't need. Even though these are things that almost all acrylic painters could use, you might not need to use. So we're just giving you that kind of time and education in this is what these things do. So. Again, the girls have put the links in to the other shows that we've had uh, on just acrylic paints themselves, the different brands. That's a great education if you're looking to buy a new brand um, or maybe just to get into acrylics. You'll, there's a whole heap and helping lot of, uh, of info on anything from sheen to body to performance in that. Then we've got the mediums and how to use them. Then we've just got like what the mediums actually look like when they're dry. So great information that any acrylic painter should have at their fingertips to access. So Amanda, have you checked ahead to see what we're doing next week? Because I didn't. I didn't. Oopsies. <laughs> Oopsies. Um, ink drawing with a brush. Okay, so. We've been getting in hot and heavy in all these different mediums and kind of some basic lessons that, you know, some people might have already had where it's not as fun and exciting. So we're shaking it up next week with something just kind of fun and random and doing some ink drawings with a brush, which although that's very much out of my comfort zone, it's a great thing that I like to do when I'm kind of getting that art block stuck, when I'm not sure what to do, when I just want to burn some time. It helps practice your brush, you know, quality lines. It helps with uh, tonal values because it's like an ink, little ink stone. And it's a super inexpensive, really cool little kit that's easy to just put in a purse and travel with even anywhere. Where you could use it even for doing like um, urban sketching. That's That would be really cool, Katie, to do urban sketching with. It really would. Because it would just be all your black and white, you know, values. So, um... So that's what we're doing next week for a little change of pace just to take a break and then we'll be jumping back into 
the lessons after that. So thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it. Again, in the search box, it's JL102 to find any of these items that we used. And we will see you next week. Take care.